Welcome to Uptown Rumble, Heavy Music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, Director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is January 18th, 2024, and I'm really happy to be here with Armando from Fahrenheit 451. Uh, and do you want to go ahead and say just a little bit about yourself before we get into things? Sure. Uh, Armando Bordas, uh, Fahrenheit 451. I'm the, Fahrenheit 451. I'm the singer. Um, also was in a short-lived project with Lenny, who's in Fahrenheit as well, called Dominican Day Parade. Um, yeah, from the Bronx, grew up on Elliott Place, uh, in the Grand Concourse. Uh, yeah, man, just, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, great. So why, why don't you start off by talking a little bit about your family history and background and whatever you know about how your family ended up in the Bronx. Uh, my mom came here first when she was about, um, I think like 17 or 18. Uh, when Dominican Republic was under uh, Trujillo. Uh -huh. uh, so she was trying to get out of there because things were getting really hairy and, you know, she just, you know, she was a bit of a very conservative but also a bit of a free spirit. So she left, came to the States. I believe she went back and my father and her came back to the States. She was never supposed to have children. They tried for years and years and years and nothing yeah. ever came of it. So she was resolved to like never having kids and, Surprise, uh, she got pregnant with me. Wow. Um, and, yeah, I mean, she was here for about a year. We lived uptown on 116th Street, right across the street from Columbia. Oh, I see. Uh, my mom came here. She was not legal, so yeah. she wound up having to work under an assumed name. Oh, sure. For years. Um, so to get papers, and she got fake papers and worked and stuff like that, and she wanted moving to the Bronx uh, when I was one. I see. My dad wanted to move back to Dominican Republic, so he left. Yeah. And I found out years later, they were divorced when they had me. Oh, wow. Okay, I see, <laughs> they I see. got together back and forth, and I have step brothers and sisters who are the same age as me, so you can put them out together. Sure, sure. You know, sure. typical, stereotypical Dominican dude, you know, secret <laughs> family type of stuff. <laughs> so uh, she stayed. We, uh, she was one of the first uh, Latinos. Uh, on Elliot, uh, with also Frank from Fahrenheit as well, who we became, you know, re really, really close with. And yeah, we grew up right on Elliot at first, you know, the ground floor, the whole typical people climbing up to your window, watching your TV and shit. And um, yeah, that, that was it. We wanted moving up to a uh, two bedroom up on the concourse, just basically up the block. We yeah. basically stayed in the same place. And uh, that was it, man. And I was there till about, you know, 17 when I went to college. I see. I see. So did you go to, um, like, the neighborhood public schools? Uh, yeah. Where did you go to school? I went to junior high school 22. Well, I went to C uh, 64, which is right on um, Townsend and Walton. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, off of 170. Um, and then I went to 22. Okay. Junior high 22, which is on 167th Street. Best beef patties and cocoa bread. <laughs> oh yeah, why not? No, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that spot's still there, but it, it, is. it moved a little. Okay, uh, like I think it moved a few blocks. I always get east, yeah. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's, it's still there. It um, took all my money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. It's called Corner Bakery. Or yeah, 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 yeah. It was right on the was right on the So I went there for school and uh, for high school. I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is coincidentally right. Oh wow! I okay, so with the tech. Okay. High school. So that was a really long commute, as you can imagine. So. And that, that's a specialized high school, right? Yeah. You had to uh, mm -hmm. go through the whole... Yeah, the testing and testing all that. Testing process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, what was your experience like in the you know elementary and junior high school near you? Um, you know something? It's one of those things where you kind of look at it... In hindsight, I, I, I'm like, oh, shit, it was kind of crazy. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was grown up in that area. It was like what I knew, so, you know... Fighting was a thing. Yeah, like, sure, sure. You know, confrontation was a thing. Constantly trying to defend yourself was a thing. It was, a, a, you know, it, it, the funny thing is, my mother was incredibly strict. Yeah, like uh, over the top strict until yeah. I was about fifteen. She like I couldn't cross the street without her being there. Like my people, kids used to make fun of me because my mom was so strict. I, I, I took it upon myself at one point. I think it was me and Frank, and then me and this other kid. We would ditch elementary school. Like you weren't allowed to leave <laughs> the building. And we would walk around the neighborhood, go to the bodegas, go to the spot and go like eat food and like, you know, grab, you know, chips and go sit in the park. And then one day, about two weeks later, my mom pulls me in and sits me down. She goes, 
I know you've been ditching school. Oh, no, that's terrifying. Like, Fuck, I'm like, how do you know? Like, you're at work all day. I don't see you until like six o'clock at night. Like, what are you talking about? He goes, I got people watching you. Oh, my. That's the most terrifying thing ever. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. And, you know, she was old school. You of know, course. Was, uh, you know, hitting and the whole yeah. fucking thing. And, you know, so it, I was just fucking terrified. I was yeah. like, oh, my God. Like, he's watching me. So <laughs> I had that in my head forever. And so I went to high school. I was like, my mom's watching me. I can't do anything. So I was. I was a good student, so I was just like, all right, cool, let me just get through this and uh, not piss her off. But, you know, it was it was a thing, you know, you had to watch your sneakers, you had yep. to, you know, but you had your friends and you had your, your crew of kids and, you know, it, it, it was his life. Yeah, sure. I didn't really think anything of it until, you know, I went to college and you hear other kids' experiences, kids from Long Island, kids from Westchester, and then you start talking about your experiences as a kid and they're like, the fuck, man? Like, what? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this is just what it was. But, you know, I, I don't want to pick, paint a picture that it, it was, there was all bad. Yeah, There sure, was sure. a lot of good times. You know, sure. You know, we got ourselves into shit and we got fun as kids, too. Yeah. You know, so. um, how old were you when you first met Frank? Um, I don't really remember. I was, um, I mean, a year old. Wow. I'll okay. Yeah, you, yeah, I'll yeah. show you a funny picture. Oh, yes. Um, which is, hold on. Um, but I can find it real quick, I think. So this is, just to give you an example of how long we've known each other, this is Frank and I at his seventh birthday. No way, wow. I'm, I'm pretty sure my mom made the cake, because yeah. my mom used to make birthday cakes. Ah, so she was a hustler. Cake. She used to make, like, just everything. I'll tell you more about that later, but. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, him and I. Like, we were just, you know, we were, he was like my big brother. Yeah. Essentially. Like, I was an only child. You know, he had two sisters. But he's my big brother. He beat me up and he protected me. And how, how much older is he than you? Uh, two, 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 two years old. Two, three years old. But he was always big kid. Yeah. Tall, big dude. So it was just like, you know, it was like, you picture My Bodyguard. You know, remember that movie, My Bodyguard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Bodyguard was. No, My Bodyguard was my the bodyguard. movie. Bodyguard yeah, was the Whitney Houston movie. Bodyguard. Yeah. Bodyguard. You know, he was, he was like the, you know, I got into shit. He would be there. He would be there for me, but he would also kick my ass occasionally yeah. just because. Yeah. You know, big brother shit. And his mom used to take care of me at one point when I was in elementary school. Like, you know, when my mom went to work, I would go there. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, we've been, you know, friends ever since. And did he go to the same schools? I mean, obviously he was a few grades of, or a couple grades above you, but did he go to the same schools as you? Just elementary school. Just elementary school. Yeah, he went, to, he went to 117, which was the other way. Oh, other okay, okay, okay. Because the funny thing was when I lived on the concourse, I was on the line. Yeah. So I, see, I, see. I was 22 was me. He was across the street of Elliot. So he was zoned for 117. Um, I was pissed because he was like, my, you know, my boy. I was like, oh, yeah, man, yeah. we go 117 together. He was like, I was like, nah, nah, nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what what kinds of things would you all do for fun around the neighborhood? Uh, get into trouble, man. Yeah. 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 Just running around like all the street games, kick the can, Skelly's, you know, Ring Olivia, uh -huh. off the point. Um, going up on roofs, jumping from roof to roof. When yep. you play cops and robbers, it would be like, you know, when they would open up the block, it'd be like, all right, only, you know, the streets and the alleys. And they'd be like, we're opening up the block. Oh, shit. Everybody be like, <laughs> on roofs, jumping off roofs. And you see somebody, like, somebody would throw something off the roof at you, like a spalding. And you'd be like, he's upstairs. And you run upstairs. And then the game would end because no one would find each other yeah, because course. everybody would just be like, God. You know, the pump in, in summers, you uh -huh. know what I mean? You know, it, it was, you know, typical street kid shit. Yeah. Um, but it was fucking fun. Yeah. You know? We just had rain, you know. There was a time when we, we didn't do this often, but because I was definitely scared of my mom. But, you know, one time we went around the block and we, like, we had smoke bombs. I don't know how we got them, <laughs> but we got smoke bombs. We, tried, we threw them in this bodega. Yeah. On 170. Oh Guy ran out, chased us out, and we're like, yo, let's go back and do it again. <laughs> Next time we get the guy came with a bat and actually chased us oh my like around the block. We're like, oh fuck, we can't go there again. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, it was those types of shit. Yeah, sure, sure, shit, sure, sure. Super fun though. Sure. Um, and uh, what kinds of things do you remember eating either in your house or outside your house when you were a child growing up? Um, always what my food my mom made. Yeah. Uh, my mom is probably she got me into cooking and um, but my mom was probably the best cook. I mean, yeah. she could just make something, it stays exactly the same, not measure anything, not do anything, just toss things, and it would be incredible. So I would always, wow. my mom was, she was one of those people who was like, there was never a kid's meal. Yeah. Right? You yeah, know, sure, it was sure. like, what's on the table is what you eat. You're going to eat that. Um, yeah. And if you don't like it, then I guess you're not eating. Yeah. Or you can go make yourself something. 
Yep. Um, so it was that, and, you know, Chinese food from around the block, yeah, you know, sure, pizza. Sure. Um, there was no McDonald's on our block. There was a, the only one was on 161 by Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And, you know, that was like a treat. Yeah, McDonald's. Yeah, sure. Uh, Frank's father used to always bring McDonald's on Fridays. And his mom used to take care of me. So I'd be like, yo, can I just stay for dinner tonight? My mom's like, nope, come home for dinner. I was like, no, they got McDonald's. They're bringing McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, basic stuff like home cooking and then all the other junk. There used to be a place called Munchtown across the street on one side. No, it was like oh, an old diner. Okay. Not the best food, but, yeah. you know, you can get a burger and fries and sure. a gyro. <laughs> and a hot dog, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, stuff like that. Um, and what kinds of music do you remember hearing, either in your house or in the street, when you were a kid before um, you started developing like your own musical taste? Spanish music yeah. all the time in my house, um, and then you know it was disco in yeah, the seventies, sure. um, and then hip hop. Um, I remember getting you know Rapper's Delight. Um, one of my first records I ever bought yeah, with yeah. my own money. Yeah. Um, and listening to it, like, oh shit. And then discovering Video Music Box. Uh -huh. um, and discovering, you know, was it like Magic Mike or whoever it was, you know, yeah. um, BLS. And then you listen to all this stuff and this, you know, watching all this stuff develop. And then you discover that, oh shit, that stuff's right down the block. Yep. You know, that club is right on Jerome. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Savoy is right over here. And you're like, wow. And I remember seeing, as a kid, seeing Curtis Blow oh, sure, in my sure. elementary school uh, uh, kind of yard. Oh, wow. Play okay, yard. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Hooked yeah, up sure. to a light pole. That was a big thing. You yep. Pause to open the, the light pole, hook up a, a boom box, and people just, you know, people wheeling. Like, it became like, at that point, it became a competition on who could have the biggest boom box. Yeah. It got to a point where people were putting that shit on wheels. So just <laughs> pushing it, you know, like a, like a fucking cart. Yep. And... I can curse, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So pushing it, and you'd be like, yo, it's this thing, it's insane. You know, block parties. So uh -huh. it'd be like, you know, and it became hip hop and got really into that, you know, dressing the part, you know, breaking, people breaking out in the street. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the initial, you know, freestyle as well. Of course, very yeah, popular. Too, so, yeah. Yeah, and then it turned into, um, well, I guess we'll get into, you know, when I got my own. You know, I started getting into music early, but... Sure, yeah. How, how old were you when you started to get into music on your own? I mean, I, I see pictures of me, like, 11 dancing to, like, disco songs. Wow. You know wow. what I mean? Like, at my birthday party. Yeah. Um, I used to go to parties. I mean, music is a big part it's, it's of all that. You. All yeah. around you. Like, you know, yeah. it's music playing in the streets constantly. Sure. You know, music in people's homes. Sure. Uh, parties. So it was like, you were exposed to it. Yeah. So... You know, it, it, it was it was a natural thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let, let, let's just keep on going with that then. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about, like, the development of your musical taste and, and all that. How, but first, how do you remember about how old you were when you when you got Rappers Delight? That was your first album you bought, you said? Shit. How old was I? Was I 19? Like, eight? Nine? Wow. I think my mom gave me money. I went to Woolworth. Wow. And I bought it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it goes 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 back to yeah because that was a bit of in nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, that's that's yeah, really that's around, around the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Wow. Because people were playing it. I remember having it. It was like in a blue sleeve. Yeah. This solid blue sleeve, like sky blue screen sleeve, and it was like yeah, I was going to play it. Wow. Wow. So yeah, that was funny. That's funny. Yeah. But I coincidentally wound up throwing it out my window, my second floor window, when I became a metalhead because I denounced everything that had anything to do, <laughs> not to do with metal. Classic fashion. So I fucking <laughs> scratched it up. And then I, I, I went to my second floor window and just flicked it like a frisbee until it hit the building across me and smashed it to pieces. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure all of us wish we could go back to that moment when we did stupid things like that. <laughs> No care, yeah, hurt records, somebody, right? slice yep. someone's neck, record. I was like, Fuck it. I'm an angsty kid. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't until um, I think I was like 13, and I lived with the blog, and he's like, "Yo, you got to come down here. You got to listen to this shit." And he played me Motley Crue "Shadow of the Duck." Ah, okay, okay, and I was okay. Like, oh my god! He showed me the artwork, yeah. like the cover, and everything. I was like, "Oh my god, this is like crazy." Yeah, yeah. And that was the start. That was a start. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. And, uh, you know, that gravitated towards Metallica. I never got into glam. Sure. It, it, that went straight into Metallica and Testament and Exodus and sure. all that type of, you know, all the thrashy stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first metal album that you bought? Hmm. 
it had to have been a cassette. Yeah. And it was probably that Columbia House get 11 cassettes for one penny. Oh, yeah. yeah that sure, whole scam. Sure, sure. And I think that was the one time I was like, oh, shit, because I didn't have any money. Yeah. I couldn't really buy stuff. Frank used to get some stuff because I think at that point we were teenagers and he had like a job. Yeah. And he had money. And so I listened to his records, his cassettes. And then finally I got on this thing. So I think I got like, I don't even remember. Metallica album because yeah. he had already been listening to Metallica and like a bunch of stuff, but yeah, yeah. And so, so Frank Frank was already already into metal and yeah, he was always a step ahead of me. He's yeah. the one you know kind of got me sure. into a lot of stuff. You know, sure, because you know, he's the kid I was closest with, and yeah, he was getting into it, so he was kind of yeah. exposing me to it because he was reading all the magazines. I see, and seeing all these band names and going, all right, let me get this and get that and get yeah. this. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what was the first uh, show that you went to, whether metal or oh, could be other things? I know that. It was yeah. uh, Megadeth okay. at Lemoore's. Lemoore's, okay. With, I believe it was with Crumb Suckers and Possessed. Oh, oh wow. Okay, and I was okay. 15. I wasn't old enough to get in. Yeah, sure. Uh, Frank was barely, I think he had, No, Frank was old enough. But for me to go, for us to go, we had to take Frank's older sister, who I think was 20 at the time. So I could get in because you can get in with an adult. I see. So I can get in. And I remember, I don't know if, if you've ever seen that commercial for U68. It was a UHF. Oh, I don't think so. Look it up. It's okay. this channel called U68 back in the 80s that used to play metal. They used to have the Metal Power Hour. It was oh. it was supposed to be competitive to MTV. Okay. And it was on the UHF dial. Oh, I for see. For all see, you see, young see, kids see, who don't see. know what UHF is, it used to be the big dial with all the networks and the little dial with like up to 100 channels. Which you can get. So it used to be 68. They used to have the Metal Power Hour, whereas MTV wouldn't play all these metal videos. They yeah. would play like Celtic Frost and oh, wow. Slayer. And they used to have a commercial for Lemoore's. Yeah. And it was like this band called Cities, which was AJ Peril from his thrash band. Oh, AJ Peril from yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would be playing, and it would just be metalheads, like just head banging. And, you know, you would see like this kind of like Guido guy get tossed out the back door and be like, no, it's metal. And when we got there, we were walking up the block, and this was like almost an hour and a half to get of course. to Bensonhurst. Yeah. And we get there, we're walking down, it's all industrial. I'm like, holy shit, the fuck, we're going to Lamar's. And as soon as we walk up to the, there was a side door, someone r- flies out and just throws <laughs> up all over the front of the, the club. And just like, like the video. <laughs> and we were like, holy shit. And we walk in, and coincidentally that night, Megadeth filmed all the live footage that you see yeah. on the Peace Cells video. Yeah. It was filmed that night in the morning. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, I was terrified. <laughs> and, but after we left there, I was like, oh, my God. That was incredible. And then it became a staple for us. We yeah. were going to Lemoore's. This is like 1986. We were going to Lemoore's almost as much as we could to yeah. see every man we could. Did, did you venture into the pit that night? No, no. <laughs> I was in the back, scared. <laughs> Everyone looked way bigger than me. Yep. Uh, and it was crazy, yeah. yeah. And, you know... Yeah, it was just nuts, like watching all these people just go crazy with all moshing. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, you see it on TV, like, yeah. we're seeing Circle of Tyrants video. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is it, you know? Like, yep. the, the, the pit. And I was like, nah, that wasn't for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I know that, um, that it's kind of a roundabout way that you took to actually, you know, performing in a band but were you thinking about picking up an instrument or anything at this never. point or never, never. um I, I tried bass once and yeah. i bought a bass but i realized like, i don't have the attention span for it yeah yeah sure um no i, I was always the one i wanted to be in the music business yeah, yeah so starting from even high school i went to a technical high school but i wasn't a math kid i wasn't a sure. science kid so at the time when i was in high school there was a i don't know if it's still around but there was a school called city ass schools huh. which was like a vocational school yeah. So, you know, they, you know, trades and stuff like that. Yeah, but they sure. used to do an internship program where you could pick a place if they, if they approved you where you can go work for yeah. a semester of your senior year and not go to school, basically. Ah. Um, so I wanted to picking a place called Time Capsule Brokerage, which is this place that used to broker studio time for artists. Okay, okay. So I wanted basically being around studios and music business. So I basically, my whole first semester of my high school year wow. was dedicated to working in this place. And it was in the built, same building. Um, we were on the same floor as Quad. Oh, okay, okay, okay. where Tupac got shot and that whole thing happened. So I was right there. So I was during high school. And I wasn't supposed to get paid, but I got hired to somebody before because this guy was, the guy who ran the place was crazy. <laughs> 
So, but he wanted me to work. Yeah. So yeah. I was getting paid. So when my internship started, it was an unpaid internship. Yeah. But he continued to pay me my full salary. Wow. So I was not going to school, getting school credit, and getting paid. Wow. So I was, you know, and working down at Midtown, and I was right around the, the corner from, you know, Sam Ash and, yeah, you, sure. know, you know, uh, 48 Custom and all those music. So I was exposed to all that stuff, so that was cool. So all my life was always geared towards being in the business. Like yeah. I wanted to be an A&R a &R guy in, in a record label. I worked at Select Records for a time. I worked at this record store called It's Only Rock and Roll. Okay, okay, Basically, okay. right across the street from Electric Lady I see, on 8th Street. So I was, like, kind of in the business. And when I first – I had met those dudes – well, I, I'm kind of fast-forwarding, I think, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I guess we'll, we'll get okay. a little more. So, yeah, no, my, my, my goal was always this, being in the business. Sure. I, I never had any aspirations to be in a band. I didn't want to be in a band. I, I was kind of like, yeah, I don't see myself being on stage. Yeah. I wasn't that guy to go up and talk in front of people. Like yeah. That. So, yeah. So, as, as you and, and Frank and some of your other friends around the neighborhood started to get into metal, um, would you all meet other metalheads around the Bronx. Um, yeah, we were like we magnets. Out. Yeah, because everyone wore the uniform, like, yeah. and you really stuck out. Yeah. You know, this was a time where that wasn't accepted at all. Sure, sure. You know, I got called more names, more derogatory names that you can imagine by kids fighting all the time because, you know, you have a bunch of long-haired kids and, metal, and, 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 and MCs and, uh -huh. you know, metal shirts and, you know, ripped up jeans. And my mom was mortified, of course, but... <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you want sure. throwing away a, a pair of ripped jeans that I had, which are my favorite, like I from Halloween, I paint all over them. And one day I was looking for them, she was like, I don't know where they are. And like a month later, she was like, I threw them away because they're like, disgusting. You look like a fucking bum. <laughs> I was like, wow, those are my favorite jeans. So, yeah, you look like a freak. And when you look like a freak, you attract other freaks. Yep. You yep. know, so we would walk around the neighborhood and we were, you know, we were still city kids. Yeah, sure, sure. So we weren't cowering because we looked different. We sure. like wore it like a badge of honor. Like, yeah. We were walking around with our boom bots, Blasted Slayer, you know, everything, you know, you know, Metallica, you know, Anthrax, and we were just that was us. Yeah. And we were we were still the same kids, but not listening to different types of music. Yeah, sure. And had a different vibe. So yeah, we would walk around and then you meet some other kids but you know, who hear the music and you know, it'd always be the same thing. Slayer <laughs> You know, and then I was like, Oh shit, another metalhead and you had no idea and yeah. then, you know, uh, which we'll get into the whole Pole Park thing, but it became like a kind of traveling circus, and we'd go over one six seven. And even though you know Mike from District Nine, who I went to junior high school with, yeah. I didn't wind up being friends with him until probably after we got out of junior high school because we were walking down the block, and he had become a metalhead, and he had like a leather vest, you know, with patches and shit on it, and like, oh shit, and we're like, oh, went to twenty two, and then introduced him to Frank, and we all kind of create a little circle of kids that we would meet up and listen to music and yeah. chill out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you want to get into the, the Pole Park uh, experience? Yeah, yeah. That became, yeah, like, yeah. that became the jump off. Like, you know, it, it was it was a spot where if you go up to the Bronx, uh, right after Fordham, so it's 187. I always forget the number, but it's like Grand Concourse, Kingsbridge, and Fordham, like in between that triangle. Yeah, so there was a Pole Park, so the Edgar Allan Poe house is yeah. there, and um it would be a place where all kids would congregate, but it was split up into different uh, sections. So in the back, you kind of had uh, hip hop kids by the uh, little atrium thing. Yeah, and then sure. Over here, you have freestyle kids, and then us. We had, used to have the bench right when you walked up, right across here in the Ortiz uh, funeral home. So we had that uh, bench and boombox. Everybody would, you know, there would there would never be too much beef. One time we got beef with the freestyle kids because yeah. they like your music's too loud and. But yeah, we would walk from 170 to Fordham and with the boom bots blasting. And we would meet friends, call them at the, you know, at the cribs because of course no cell phones. Yeah, sure, sure. Like, hey man, we're going to Poe. Like, all right, cool. Like we'll meet you here, we'll pick up kids, and then we'd meet up all these other metalheads that we didn't live in our neighborhood, lived up town, other places. Yeah, yeah, we all yeah. congregate there, sit there, listen to music and uh, and chill out. And it was just fun, man. It was yeah. like nice to find like minded people. In a place where you felt like you were constantly being tested, yeah, for sure. For who you were, for sure. So, for yeah. sure, were there were there uh, very many metalheads at Brooklyn Tech when you? No, yeah. we had uh, I have a funny picture too. There was a we had one little corner table in the lunchroom. Okay, I had there were probably six of us, yeah. seven of us, 
and we all hung out there with the kind of scattered hardcore punk kids, like all the outcasts, like your typical high school yep. se- segregation kind of like yep. environment. So yeah, no, you know, I want to be good friends. This is a funny picture of, uh, of graduating high school with one of my two metal friends. Oh, here he is. So this is my friend Steve, and I think this other kid's name was Nick in the middle. <laughs> In front of that. <laughs> okay, okay. Graduated from high school. But yeah. yeah, it was very, very, and my other friend Dino, it was very, very few of us. Um, I want to introduce those guys to my neighborhood friends. Uh, sure. They want to form bands and doing different things together. But no, not many. Yeah. You know, it was it was mostly predominantly like, because the way it was sectioned was like mostly Asian, like half Asian, half black, and then I scattered see. other people. So, you know, other kind of ethnic uh, backgrounds. But um, it was hip hop or like super duper gothy free uh, gothy new wave. Oh, so it was a well, time of like when the course. Asian kids like super high hair flipped over to the side, blonde streaks, all in black trench coats. So it's like a lot of that or hip hop. I see, I and see. very few of the other. Yeah, you know, we were like the other. Yeah, yeah, we were definitely the freaks. <laughs> yeah, and when when you when you first got into metal, I know you said you swore off hip hop. Did you? start listening to it again at any point like in your teenage years oh i always listen to it. i was sneak okay. listening to yeah. it you know what i mean <laughs> free stock to my friends because that wouldn't be metal um but uh, you know you kind of wore that like a metal yeah, yeah um yeah no it was um yeah it, 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 i still listen to it yeah sure 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 you know, sure was, you know, that's in no way but sure. not as much i was kind of really focused on that stuff and i was uh, yeah. on metal and just listening to that song music and this is uh I got funny stuff, man. I kind of pulled some shit for you. Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> Let's see whatever you got here. Yeah, man, the metal years. The metal years. <laughs> mustache. Mustache, uh, growing out the hair. Like, hair. Mom <laughs> hating me. Like, you know, <laughs> for my choices. I think that was like 1987. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but I used to listen to all that stuff. I, yeah, at, sure. at that time, I wanted going out with, with this girl who was super into freestyle. Yeah, yeah. So... I was, you know, I go to freestyle parties and I knew all that shit. But yeah, I was sure. like, try to act like I didn't. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Were you ever the type of um, metalhead to get into like, you know, tape trading far away and writing to no. bands, no. individuals, no. things like that? Yeah, 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 you know, it was it was one of those things that you, you heard about it. Yeah. We would get the tape somehow. Yeah. Uh, again, Frank, another one of my sources, you know what I mean? Yeah. He would somehow get stuff. Yeah. You know, he throw music at me I'd be like holy shit never heard of this stuff and then, yeah. but never got into that yeah sure. I think I was focused enough I was sure. just kind of in my bubble sure, of sure, stuff sure. we were doing but I had other friends who would get that stuff and present it and we would dub it and then but no, no, no long distance you know yeah, postage yeah, yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff um, had you been exposed very much to um, punk hardcore or anything like that at this point a little bit I had a friend in high school who gave me a tape once and yeah. had a Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, Bad Brains, uh, I think Gorilla Biscuits, maybe. A yeah. bunch of different Misfits. Oh, Misfits. Okay. Minor okay. Threat. Yeah. Um, and I was, I listened to it and I was like, eh, you yeah. know, like, I was like, was, like, I liked the Dead Kennedys because they were kind of weird. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Bad Brains, I didn't get at all. Yeah. Misfits, I didn't get at all. Yeah. Minor Threat, eh. And then Cro Mags on there, which I was like, sounded kind of metal, but yeah. it was a little like, I wound up seeing Chrome Mags at one point I, in 86 or 87. It was like Anthrax, Metal Church, Chrome Mags oh, at I the see, Beacon. And I was just like, ah, I don't really get it. Yeah. You know, but um, I was listening like here and there. And I want at 15, I wound up going to um, CDs. Okay, okay, sure. For a matinee. Because my friend at the time, Dino, who I went to high school with, wound up playing in this band called Crossover. Oh, okay. So okay. my first CDs matinee it was like 15 or 16. It was Crossover. Uh, new school. No, we're playing. We're playing, we're playing a new, yeah, crossover. New school and in your face. I see. And almost got beat up. Uh, Long haired metalhead MC walking to CBs. Didn't know anything about it. Standing in the front for my friend playing, like right in front of the stage. All of a sudden, uh, this kid this looked like a grown ass man slams the back of my knees into the front of the stage, and I'm like. The fuck? And, I, you know, even though I was a metalhead, yeah, a metal sure. kid, I was still, like, a kid from the Bronx. So yeah. I was, like, you know, about to, like, you know, square up. Yeah. And I turn around and I see this dude, probably the scariest dude I've ever seen in my fucking life. <laughs> and, and I was, like, I looked at him and I was, like, nah, let me just take an L on this. And he looked at me and he was, like, he wanted being a very notorious New York hardcore guy, very violent. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I escaped getting myself thrown into the, being in the hospital that night by <laughs> avoiding that guy because I was like, dude, if I would have, he would have fucking killed me. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And I was like, yeah, you know, that was a good move. And um, but yeah, it wasn't something like that yet. Sure, sure. Um, because it was it also it was like long hair. It was yeah, like, you know, it was like the other things like long hair band. That was what you're into. Like, that's, yeah. that's metal. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Pedestrian. <laughs> um, do you remember any albums from this period of your life that particularly like blew your mind or any shows um, that particularly blew oh, your yeah. mind that you went to? Uh, yeah. Metallica Master Puppets. Yeah, yeah. Sure. First time I heard it, we were just like, I remember listening to Frank uh, in Frank's bedroom. We put it on. He's like, yo, I just got this. He was like, put it in. I was like, we're like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, like what you hear of what people listen to, like some of those records, we were like, what the fuck? I remember once I was in gym and my friend, I believe it was Steve, was like, yo, come in here. Yeah, listen to this. So yeah, like a walk when he put it on. And it was Slayer Ring and Blood. Ah, okay. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah. I, and we were just like, holy shit. And those two records, I think, stand out sure. the most. And Exodus Bonded by Blood. Sure, 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 yeah. Stand out the most uh, to me. And... Uh, and, and Celtic Frost, yeah, we were watching oh, Circle of Times nice. video, and we were just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And seeing Slayer at Lamore's was probably one of the most insane shows I've ever been to in my entire life. Who they, who they play with? This band, yeah. called, Nevermore. Oh, okay. But the thing is still around. Okay. They basically got into two songs, yeah. and it was so loud that they got booed off the stage. <laughs> Yeah. In between songs, Lamores would play videos and yeah. different stuff. Uh, you know, DJ would play different songs. People were moshing and dancing from the minute that music was being played. It was it was like almost like practice. Um, almost got beat up in the bathroom by skinheads. Oh man! That night, I remember this dude, uh, Dominican Bill, rest in peace. He we didn't know him. Yeah, like, he knew us from going to shows, but yeah, he didn't, sure. I didn't, we didn't know him. But we were long hair metalheads. There was a lot. It was a big mix like that night. It was like punks, skins, like metal kids, and it was ultra violent. I see. I see. When we're going to the bathroom with my boy, and these two skins approach us, and we're yeah. like, "Oh fuck! Like, what the fuck?" Want to beat us up? Dominican Bill walks in. Yeah. He knew us, and he knew we were Latino. He used to wear like a Dominican flag yeah, on, sure. his, on his flight, and he basically told the two skin dudes, "Like, get the fuck out of here and get fucked up." And these, these were white power. I don't know if they were white power. There were some there, but they were getting like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't yeah. know if they were white power, white dudes, but yeah, yeah, sure, uh, sure. You know, it was a, like at that point, a lot of Latinos and and people of color in the scenes. So yeah. I was like, a lot of those guys were all kids from you know, a lot of kids from Sunset. Sure, and they were in the scene. They were like kind of policing that shit. But yeah, Dominican Bill came in. and was like, "Yo, get out of here! You're gonna get fucked up." Yeah, yeah. So they left. It was, and they had somehow, I don't know how they got those crosses in the moors, but the upside down crosses on both sides yeah. lit up. And we were just, it was right before they played that Felt Forum show where all the cushions got ripped up. Uh, yeah, they did, yeah. did a warm up show at the moors. And we were there and it was violent. Like from start to finish, it was fucking crazy. Yeah. And also seeing another show that was like that. I didn't know anything about the band because Frank had told me about it right before with the show. I was like, next figure for the show tonight, the marquee. Band called Pantera. Okay. I'm like, I'm like, all right, go. Like, you put it on Cowboys from Hell. I'm like, all right, cool. And we went another show, which was like blew me away. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But by then I was more getting into more. I was more of a hardcore kid, but yeah, it was sure. it was like kind of a mix. And it was like you walk into the room and it was like you know Lou and Pete from Sick of It All there. Everybody like all these like hardcore wow. people at the show. So. Wow. But Slayer was probably the one that was the most insane I've yeah. been into in my life. Yeah. 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 Wow. I don't know. I got out of there without. <laughs> and I'm I'm sure there's probably no escaping the pit. Probably the entire. Oh no! By then, was, by, then, by then I was dancing. Yeah, by then okay, I was okay, in the pit. I was marching. Yeah, yeah. By then yeah, I was yeah, pulling, yeah. like diving. Like I was just like, yeah, yeah I was that kid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did you ever have any um, serious in- injuries from your dancing? Uh, yeah, one at that Pantera show. Yeah. I wanted uh, climbing on top of heads. I'm like, you know, head walking. And at the marquee, there was this lip in the front of the stage. There was like the stage and a lip in the front. I wound up falling. They dropped me on the edge and just banged my back up. I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. So I didn't know how bad it was until I went home. And I would – I pulled my shirt up and I went to my mom. I'm like, mom, is, is, do I have a mark on my back? She was like, oh, my God. I looked in the mirror. It was a bruise that took up almost the whole side of my back. Wow. Like, holy shit. Oh my god. 
Um, yeah, never. Once when I played, uh, I got my eyes split open. Oh, sure. sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my, te- my teeth chipped. But yeah, but uh, yeah, no, at shows, kind of became, got out unscathed. We were kind of ignorant too, though. Like yeah. when me and Mike and all of us were getting the pit, we were like ignorant kids. We like took advantage, you know? <laughs> I'm a little ashamed of that, but we used to like dance hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. That was, that, it was fun, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, how did you start like clicking more with hardcore? And, and were you still in high school when that started happening or after high school? Um, at the end of 1989, I was, um, I was, I graduated high school, I was about to go to college, still long hair, still into metal, kind of getting into hardcore, like again, you know. Friends of mine, or sure. you know, but not really into it. Um, I had I had to go up to school. I went to school in New Paltz. Yeah. I, I wanted to, to go up to school to take some courses before, so I was living up there for the first two months taking courses. Then I came back, and the day I came back, I only had two days before I had to pack up my shit and go back to school. Yeah, Frank's like, "Yo, I got tickets to this show at Lemoore's. You want to come?" It was like a matinee. They started doing like hardcore matinees. So I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" He was like, uh, "It was the Bad Brains. It was Bad Brains." Uh, 24 7 Spies and Leeway. I was like, fuck it, we'll go. Um, Leeway, 24 7 Spies, both like, like them both. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, Bad Brains gets on, blew me away. This is when HR was still HR. It was that, that whole reunion, excuse me, for the Quickness Tour. Yeah. Did a backflip on that small ass stage. It came out with a Bible, it was just like singing. He was like, one, two, three, four. And I was just like, it wasn't packed. Yeah. It was not packed the way I knew a little more to get packed. And I was blown away. I was yeah. like, holy shit. Yeah. Also seeing some people of color up there doing yeah, sure. fucking ultra heavy music. It was like, like all of them. It was just, just yeah. like, what the fuck? Yeah. Busting into reggae. You know, like, it, it just blew my mind. I did, never really listened to it. When I saw it live, it connected the dots. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I'd heard them before, didn't get it. And when I saw them, I was like, all right, I get it. Yeah. Went to college. Um, and I'll block my friend's face because she probably my old friend's face, but. Yeah, I went to college and I had this is what I look like in in college. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. This yeah, was yeah. like probably my first week in college. A month later, college. a month later, I cut all my hair off. <laughs> um, but right before that, funny thing is, like my first week of school, I was walking around campus. And I see this dude, um, and he has a Raw Deal shirt on. Uh, okay, okay. And I heard a band. I was trying to get into hardcore. And I go up to him like, yo, you like hardcore? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I saw him. And then, and then coincidentally, there was a party down in the, my dorm, down on the ground floor, and he was there. Yeah. I'm like, hardcore shit. I'm like, I went up to him. I was like, yo, you like hardcore? He goes, yo, come with me. He brings me upstairs to his dorm room. He gives me like 15 cassettes. He goes, like, token entry, rest in pieces, killing time. Like, everything. He's like, yo, listen to this. Sick of it all. Yeah. And he gave me all these cassettes. He's like, this is all this stuff. And then from then on, it was just like, um, he's still my best friend today. Oh, actually. wow. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh-huh. um, you know, so that kind of was, and then from then on, it was like drives to CBs, to wetlands. I wanted to go to the anthrax a couple of times. Yeah. Saw so Burn, was it Super Touch Burn? Sick of it all. Oh, wow. At the anthrax, drive, I, drew, I drove there in a hatchback in the middle of winter because there was no room for me. So I just sat in the hatchback <laughs> to Danbury and then back to oh New Paltz. I did that twice. I did that to go to the Super Bowl hardcore too. <laughs> um, so yeah, then it, it it progressed, and then that's when it, it I was full blown. I then again, super extremes denounced everything metal. Uh huh. It was all hardcore shit. Like fuck anything that was metal. Fuck any of that long hair shit. Like, yeah, it's all hardcore. Yeah, yeah. yeah Predominantly yeah, New York yeah. hardcore, though. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you're in when you're in college, you're still going down the whole um, you know A and R working in the business kind of path. Um, did you have like additional internships or anything with record labels while you're in college? Um, I did one at Select, yeah, uh, which I mentioned before. They had like uh, Chub Rock, oh, was okay, their okay. big one. Um, my friend worked there, and I worked at a record store, like I said before. I can't remember. I worked at that studio place a lot in yeah. between college for yeah, like two yeah. or three years because they were put me out there, and um, that was it for that until I graduated college. I see. Yeah. I see. Then I interned when I graduated college. I see. I see. And was was Roadrunner shortly after that, or that's later? Yeah, yeah that was when I got out of college. Um, I couldn't find a job. Yeah. Um, and then people, I was like, all right, I gotta try and find an internship. So I got an internship at Roadrunner. 
I see, I see. Probably three months after I graduated college. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted working there, basically uh, working radio marketing. No, doing doing alternative radio. Okay, okay. So sure. calling up radio stations, which I thought was whack. Yeah. I'm not made for it. Trying to convince somebody at, you know, places that are playing, you know, like, you know, super progressive, like alternative music to play doggy dog. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. You know, it's like, I like Drive by Jason. It's like, no, no. It's like, it's like, dog. It's like no. So that was always tried, you know? I bet. Um, but yeah, dude, that got me in the door. And from there, I wound up running the mailroom there, which that exposed me to, a, you know, a whole, that's where I started, you know, I wound up working, you know, meeting, you know, Adam from, who want to play in Shelter and H2O. Sure. And then, you know, I used to hire, hire all my friends when it used to be crunch time, mailings going up. And then I became like the marketing sales assistant, and that was until I wanted to leave him there. I see, I see. And uh, during all this time, did you like keep in very close touch with Frank and yeah. knew what was going on? Um, well, well, I worked there is when I wanted to join the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see, um, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were all my friends. They were yeah, playing, sure. you know, th- during college, they were playing about a cause. So I would come down and see him at Bond Street. Yeah. Um, they would come and visit me. Yeah. Sometimes, like my freshman year, coincidentally, um, Frank came up with a bunch of my other friends. Dino Murphy's Law was playing a party for this, for this fraternity called Pal Fanu. Okay, okay. Behind the beer distributor on Main Street in New Paltz. Raining mud, Jimmy throwing kegs out into the middle <laughs> of the fucking thing. One of my, my Planet Earth teacher doing bong rips. Oh my god. It was fucking nuts. Like we wound up going back to my dorm. We were all covered in mud, throwing all the muddy clothes in the ruining three washers because it was just caked mud inside. It was bananas. So yeah, it was it was it was kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I, I I was in touch with them throughout my entire yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, it was my buddies. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um it this might be skipping ahead too much, and if so, we we can hold it up to later, but um but how did the whole conversation about you joining Fahrenheit 451 come about? Um, that was a total fluke. Yeah. Um, we, they were looking for a singer because they, they were without a cause. I think they were, they were having problems with their singers. So they were trying out all these singers. I used to hang out with them all the time. So I used to go to the rehearsal space with them at Fastlane. Yeah, sure. I was buddies with them. And I was trying to you know, inject myself in the business. And also, like, I had this dream of, like, all right, maybe one of my buddies' bands I can kind of get in something if something's happening this could be because it was so ultra tough yeah so so i used to hang out with them and go over there and then they had tried out a couple a few people and then finally i was in the studio with them i had never sang in a band i was never in a band like none of that shit not even fucking around yeah sure um and they were like yo why don't you try and i'm like yeah like i don't yeah like nah and then finally one day i went to rehearsal they're like why don't you just get up there and try something so i did and they were like all right man rehearsal's next week <laughs> I was like, all right, I guess I'm in the band. And I, I have such vague memories of it, but I just remember just all of a sudden, like, I was in a band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was singing in a band. And yeah. it was really fucking weird because I was like, I never thought I had a voice for it. And yeah, it just kind of morphed from there and, you know, just progressed. And, you know, we were without, without a cause for You're a little bit, a cause, for like right. a few months, and then we changed the name. Yeah. And um, just one thing, coincidentally, which is kind of funny, we changed the name to Fire 451. Um, I never read the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I find yeah. it boring. You you came up with the title or with the with yeah, the yeah, name, right? and it was because we all smoked a lot of weed, <laughs> um, and it was the temperature of the paper burned. Yeah, and yeah. I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, we kind of you know we played into it, and uh, you know, no one, right. but everybody always thought it was like the book, and I was like, nah, I don't really like the book. So I, like, I like I like I like the theme, the, the book theme, and that had played sure, a little bit sure, sure. but yeah, it was more about weed smoking. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Um, so uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about Roadrunner, but before I do so, um, and before we go down more of the Fahrenheit 451 route, uh, when you were into metal and hardcore before any of this um, came about with you know without a cause Fahrenheit 451, did you do you remember going to any shows in the Bronx? Um, no. Yeah. yeah there yeah, were yeah. none. Yeah. There was there was no scene. Yeah. Um, when I was around. Um, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, no, I mean, we played a couple of shows when the Depot was around. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, no, it was all city or Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, mostly cities, a lot of CBs and stuff yeah, sure. like that. But sure. Yeah, never. Sure. Yeah, it was, a, it was a different time, right? It was like those kids didn't really uh, 
there was not like no unifying force. Like there yeah. was Pope Park. That was it. Yep. There was no like let's put the shows together. No there, was no, there was yeah. no bands. When I was a kid doing that type of shit, we had like our little things where we record in the basement of a building. Yeah, Somebody sure. Record in the basement of the building, but yeah. Yeah. There's never anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's just little things that popped up here and there, like the Chippewa Club, I think, in '92, yep. maybe something like that. Yeah, I think like Lenny played up there. I yeah, yeah, someplace he did. Uptown. He um, did, like near Westchester Square. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Where it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, and then there's some some. It was like I keep forgetting the name of it, like Metal Mania or something at some church. Um, at yeah. Some point. In that might have been '90s as way well. after my time. Like, I mean, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but it's just little one-off things here and there. Yeah. Um, there was, and, and the thing was, I don't think at that time when we were around, there were people willing to put those shows on there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you yeah. know, there was no real kind of. Yeah, there was no cohesion when it came to us to the scene. Absolutely, it's like random kids everywhere. You meet each other, like, oh, cool, yeah. like you know this shit, and that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so why, why don't you talk a little bit more about uh, your time at Roadrunner and um, everything you learned about, uh, you know, the business, maybe bands that you um, that you you know worked with or um, were exposed to there. Uh, whatever you want to share about your time at Roadrunner. Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot there. I mean, it was like my first, uh, not my first, but it was like. I was immersed in it, you know. As an intern, you kind of get you, you kind of get thrown to different things because you know you kind of are the schlup and you, yeah, you know, sure. kind of toss you around and do shit. So I got really exposed, and I made some really great relationships there, you know. Um, and I got exposed to the new bands. I got you know I was out of metals, but then all of a sudden it's like Sepultura, Typo Negative, Life of Agony. I was like, oh shit! Like I, these are bands I I wasn't really listening to. Yeah, sure. Uh, Madball, which I heard before, you know, course, from yeah. the Seven Inch, but. You know, and dog eat dog and things like that. So it was refreshing. Yeah. Um, and it was full of people who were into that yeah. stuff. And then also just going into, you know, when I got up to the mailroom, you go in there and then you want to find all this old shit. You want to find all the old Hawker stuff, like the wow. token entry, rest in pieces stuff. And you're like, holy shit, I wish I would have kept a lot of that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it was a learning experience. So they had such a rich history in heavy music. So I was like kind of discovering little things, even metal stuff that I had no awareness of. Cause I was like into thrash. It was known. And I was like, not really getting into like the real underground shit. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I want to meeting Howie there, which is really kind of, um, important in our, in the, in, in our bands, like kind of, um, trajectory. Sure. So, yeah, it was just like a great experience going to shows, you know, Mad, you know, when they returned, when they opened up CVs again for matinees, Madball play. Yeah. So I want to go on there postering up the place, and it was just fun. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a great experience. Yes. Yeah, sure. And and also introduced me to other bands that I had never heard of, you know, Die Monster Die, and you know, uh, which I thought was awesome, uh, you know, Buzz Oven, which I, was just crazy. It was it was just you got thrown into a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was a great it was a great time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after you you know find yourself a member <laughs> without a cause, uh, and then eventually Fahrenheit four fifty one, um, where was the band at in its development at, at that point? I mean, I know it's a relatively rapid kind of development sonically mm -hmm. and all, but um, but when you started, where were they at, and where did you end up? They were kind of in that Brooklyn. And then they were, since they were rehearsing at Fastlane, yeah. you know, like Biohazard, all those bands. So they were very kind of almost heavy, yeah. but had that kind of, you know, thing groove that, it. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of groove to it uh, that those bands had also. So they were kind of on that level, but yeah. not, not where we want to be. So they were, they were heavy, but then I came into the band and I guess because of my own limited vocal range. <laughs> You know, and also all our taste, like musical taste. Like, yeah, sure. I kind of gravitated towards more like kind of the spoken, rappy style. So we kind of s morphed into that with, with melody. Yeah, sure. Right? So incorporating both those things. Because we all came from all the, you know, that background of all these different types of styles of music. Yeah. I would say they were more traditional. I wouldn't say generic, but more traditional, like that type of sound. Yeah. And then when I came in the band... And, you know, we went through our various drummers to where we are now, and Kev and Frank, and it melted it all together, yeah. and it became what it is yeah, 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 yeah. now. Yeah. Because you, jo you joined first, and then Kevin came after, yeah. right? Yeah, we had another bass. Well, it was uh, Dave from Four in the Chamber. Yeah, Dave was the, yeah, the, was original, the original bass player. player. Uh, 
Yeah, and that didn't work out. And then we got Kev. Yeah. I forgot how we got Kev. That's funny. Probably Kev told me the story. Yeah, he did. Okay. He did. He did. <laughs> um, yeah. I think he said you were auditioning, you know, a few different mm-hmm. people. And Lenny's the one who gave him a call and okay. asked if he wanted to audition. And he obviously uh, knew Caesar from District 9. Yep. There's all that connection. Yeah, it was school together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so um, as far as the recordings go, uh, I know there's, like, you know, the the kind of interesting timeline where the New York's hardest material uh, you recorded first, but it came out later. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you, you were there for those recordings, yes. right? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah. Why don't you talk about like, you know, recording uh, those songs, recording the, the two song EP after that and what was going on, like recording uh, behind the scenes and everything. Um, I was, it was a whirlwind really for me because I had no, I had been in studios before, of course, and all that stuff. Being behind the mic, I felt, it it took a while for me to feel comfortable. So I always remember, and I listen to those songs now, and I I can listen to them a bit now, but I found them really incredibly cringing for, cringy for, (laughs) I see, I see, I see. Because I was just like, oh my God, like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, it's not, like, I want, I can hear what I want to sound like, and then my voice doesn't sound that way. Um, I was... It's incredible that we got to be on the Earth's Hardest because I'd, yeah. and I'd never imagined that it would kind of become what it became, right? Yeah, so, sure. Um, we, I listen to those songs now, and we, we sound so different than yeah. all those other bands on there. And I'm like, man, are we... It was always a kind of thing, like, are we a hardcore band or are we not a hardcore band? Yeah, like, sure. What are we trying to do here? Like, or should we stick to a certain sound? And we just kind of went with, like, all right, let's throw a riff out there. It is what it is, and let's just see where it takes us and yeah. how it works. And that's always been our thing. Um, but yeah, recording those songs was, I, you know, it's all a blur to be honest. Yeah, sure, sure, I remember sure. doing the artwork or th- that, that cover is actually, I have the, the drawing over here was a drawing from a friend of mine from college. Oh wow. Okay. 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 Yeah. So he drew that and we want to put it on the cover. I remember, oh, I, I remember photocopying the covers I wrote on it. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Uh, oh, we photo, we photo, photo, no, we, we got those professionally done, but I remember doing all the flyers instead of wrote on it. So uh, every final for our show, I put them together because I was working the front for the yeah. while as an assistant, so I worked the front desk. So I'd just be there putting together, like, collaging, things like that. But, yeah, it was, uh, it was all a blur, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, as far as the, the lyrics go, um, were you and did you remain, like, the primary lyricist yeah. in the band? Yeah. Initially, I, we, we took two Without a Call songs, and I reworked them, yeah. which was No More Promises, which Frank wrote a lot of the lyrics for. Sure. Fragments and part of Settle. Yeah. And I kind of filled in the blanks because yeah. we didn't have, and we did a couple of without a cost songs in the beginning. Um, yeah, but I then I become the principal uh, lyricist. But sure. When we first started, Frank had written a bunch of things, but yeah, it, it morphed into that. So I've been the one who's been, and then I would bring in certain things, and like Lenny wrote the hook for Blind, like yeah. he would come in and someone would, or, or someone would say something in the chorus, and I'd be like, oh shit, and I write around it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, why, why don't you talk a bit more about like your process of if you have a process of of writing lyrics and what that what that looks like and you know things that particularly inspired you as far as writing lyrics around. Um, it's changed. I mean, I write a lot of like personal stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah, lot yeah, of stuff, yeah. you know, loss, Absolutely. hope, love, like you know, um, positive things for the most part. Yeah, I mean, sure. when I first started doing it, I would write. Um, so basically, they would send me. They would give me riffs, and I would try to come up with something, yeah. which is, could be a little trying because you're writing to the riff and not writing to the song, and not sure. writing to the lyrics. So I would be like, "All right, I try to fit things into spaces." Uh, that created our sound, I think, because a lot of our shit's all over the place yeah. sometimes. But yeah. it, it, you know, I would kind of write around it, write for the riff. Yeah, sure. Um, thankfully, now the way we've written these two new songs. Well, writing around the song, so the process has been different. Like I got the ri- we, we formulated the riffs with the with the with Lou the drummer, and then I kind of have a rudimentary like understanding of Garage Band. So I want yeah, to be sure. recording vocals here. I would send it to the guys so they can get an idea of what I'm going for, and we work it from there. So it's been a, a better process. I see. I see. Uh, our writing process before I think was a little bit fractured. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I, it was never a thing that I felt. 
comfortable. I think now we've started to write for the song a little bit more. Yeah. And it wasn't until we recorded some of those uh, uh, those songs that we released on the discography that were never released on, like, um, uh, when we were a band that our producer at that time, uh, Mike Barilli, who wound up doing a lot of the Candiria stuff, did yeah. most of the Candiria stuff. He was just like, yo, guys, like, he was seeing me trying to sing in a certain key because the song was in that key. Like, yo, you gotta, guys got to write to the song. Stop writing like you could be the greatest guitar player in the fucking world, greatest drummer, but yeah. if the song sounds like shit because you're not writing to your vocalist or writing to the song, like it doesn't matter how great you sound and you play. Yeah, sure. That put it in our heads, and I think we took that bit of it, and now that we're trying, we're starting to write more music. Now we've adapted that style uh, into our I writing see. process. But yeah, the things are all like you know real world shit. Yeah, they are. Yeah, you know, and, yeah, and that's stuff I know. Yeah, that's right. That's right, and you know, it's it's interesting because among Many other ways that you stand out from, you know, I guess the crowd of, you know, hardcore bands in the 90s, uh, you know, it's, it's not the, I'm going to kick your ass, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, beat down kind of. <laughs> yeah, but it's a testament to our, you know, the, what we all listen to, and, yeah. you know, it's like melodic, you know, it's got a little bit of that Fugazi kind of thing, does, yeah. but then it has a little bit of that burn, orange nine millimeter, quicksand thing, and Absolutely. it's like, you know, but it's got that hip hop thing, you know, it's like, I'm. It's it's all the things you know. It's got Latin things, so we got a little, uh -huh. you know some Latin beats in it because we all grew up with that. It's like that's it's right. almost you can't help but hear it in your ears, and that's what you're going to project onto what you play. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Well, you you mentioned a few bands just now that are part of like the musical DNA of, of Fahrenheit 451. Are there any bands you know, or records you know um, uh, potentially at the time that you know the band kind of you know unified around as far as oh, records sure. that all of y'all were oh yeah the burn seven inch yep mm -hmm. quicksand slip uh amazing albums fugazi uh-huh um a lot of us love sunny day yeah um yeah i mean those the funny thing is we were all into that red man record that what <laughs> not, not what the, um, the the muddy waters oh yeah okay okay like yeah, we yeah, would yeah, play yeah. that shit like non-stop so uh you know, for that song Taxi, I basically lifted Biggie, uh, you know, as like, who the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I lifted that for the intro, you know, for that. So it was like all those things we gelled around. Um, I've always been a big Rage Against the Machine fan. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, that was stuff. I, you know, I, like I drew my my vocal inspiration predominantly from Shock Chaka. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Burn Orange 9 millimeter, and a lot from Zach. Yeah. So those are my kind of, and and also sonically the way he not the not his vocal style but the way he sings is Walter from Quicksand. Ah, sure, that sure. Very sure. rhythmic, absolutely bouncy thing. Absolutely um, is where I take a lot of my inspiration from. Absolutely, yeah. and coincidentally, Sergio's from the Bronx as well. <laughs> yeah, I know Sergio. Yeah, shout out yeah, Sergio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, Ke Ke Kevin shared yesterday. He said he remembers. Or at least it's in his memory that in all or most, if not all, of of your shows for a period of time, you put on the Orange Nine, the first record. Oh yeah, <laughs> and that would be yeah. you know one of the one of the yeah yeah albums. Yeah, that Driver record is yep. fucking amazing. Is amazing. I even that song Guided. I basically because Orange Nine did that that Ultraman versus Godzilla record was that one. And they had that one song. No, no, Pretend I'm Human. And that song, Pretend oh, I'm okay. Human, they did, did that kind of like uh, trip hoppy beat. And I was, yeah. at the time, I was I, like, I really loved like Ronnie Size yeah. and shit like that. And um, and oh, what was that other guy's name? Um, shit, I can't remember. But he, they had that kind of like trip hop beat. Yeah, sure. And that's the reason I was like, yeah, let's do that trip hop beat and guide it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I got that from Orange Night. <laughs> okay, okay. And, you know, of course, like all the other trip hop shit, but they yeah. did, it, did it heavy. And I was like, oh, shit, we can do that too. Yeah, for sure. For so, sure. Yeah. Um, so how long after when you when you first joined um, were you thrown into, you know, performing the show? Um, I forgot what Len Lenny has a very good memory when it comes he to does. his timelines, but I think it was like 95, so not that long after we yeah. played our first show at the Pyramid. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to say, is there a video of it? I know there's a video of us, like probably the second or third thing where we play without Lenny. We wound up jumping on in a District 9 set. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, probably a six months, I think. Wow. Five, six months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Scary. 
Well, that is cool. <laughs> Do you remember who else was on the bill at that pyramid? No. Show? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Lenny Lenny yeah. probably does. I, Lenny might have even mentioned it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But no, I didn't have to go back and listen. Um, and uh, uh, what was the experience like, you know, your first live performance? Being super stiff. Yeah. Like, I felt like, I don't know what I was going for. Yeah. And I, rem- I I see videos of myself moving around that time, and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I don't even know what I was modeling myself. Like, I was trying to be, look hard, sound a certain way. I didn't know how to do my, my voice. Yeah, like, sure. I, I just, I'm confused. Yeah. I think it would be the word I would use. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, fish out of water. I was yeah, like, yeah. trying to find myself. It wasn't until years later that I realized I could just be me. Yeah, right? you know sure. I mean? I'm goofy, I'm, you know, do whatever. Just yeah. move the way you want to move. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it wasn't until we went on tour with H2O, I was like watching Toby. Uh, just be, like I, I watched him, he was so fucking free. Yeah. Like he was just moving like the way, you know what I'm saying? I was like, oh shit. That, I want to be able to just be as free. And I was just like, I could still sing these songs and be heavy and hard, but at times, and but still move the way I want. Yeah. yeah. I see, I see, I see. Um, and at least from, you know, from this early period, are there any shows that stand out to you as, as ones that, you know, uh, were particularly like, uh, you know, a notch above the others? That we played? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, playing at Irving. Yeah. When we opened up at VOD. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Was... And there's a video on YouTube of that as well, like clips of it, was absolutely fucking insane. Yeah. Like we had an EP out, that's it. And sold out like two bands before we even went on, like completely at capacity. Crazy. When we played the the, the P, not the uh, Common Ground. Yeah. Was it the P-Rack at the time? The p Rack became the Common Ground in Long Island. Mm-hmm. Opening for H2O, and it was us, Trip Face, H2O. Um, they shut they shut the show down after we played because it got so fucking crazy. Wow, that was an incredible show. Tramps, yeah, with H2O was always great times. We played two shows there. That was always like insane. Yeah, um, yeah, there was so many. I mean, we had great shows. Like, yeah, sure, a lot of shows at Coney Island, High, sure, sure. Wetlands. Oh, yeah. yeah, once this, once the ball started rolling, um, and we got co-signed, I guess, by a couple of bands. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, all these kids came out of the woodwork. It, it, it was like a good year or two that we played in front of nobody. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, we were just doing off shows, playing Staten Island, and whatever we can get on, and sure. whatever it wasn't. And then we got in with our friends, uh, uh, Vaughn and Kenny over at Strong, who yeah. were managing us and kind of put us in the room with different people. And then that's when it kind of I picked see. up. I see, I see, I see. But we were just we were just on the grind, you know. Like, yeah. Give us sure. whatever show we want to play. We, sure. We'll play it. And we want to play with Motorhead ones. Oh, Lenny, Lenny, Lenny told me about that. Urban Dance that Squad. Sounds like a very <laughs> odd show. Because it was like, an, it was an empty, like, Motorhead show just because it wasn't advertised. Yeah, yeah right? it wasn't advertised. It was an off date for Oz Fest. It yeah. was us, Monster Voodoo Machine. Huh. This band called Hinge, I think. Huh. And us. And it was no one there. But we had a great, uh, funny story with, uh, with Lemmy. <laughs> you you, you want to go ahead and tell me? Yeah, yeah. There was two. One was, um, at one point, we're, we're sound checking. And, uh, uh, Lemmy can't hear apparently. Yeah, I haven't met Lemmy once at Rona years ago, but he, we're, we're sound checking. We have like all our backs to the, you know, to the front of the venue, and we hear somebody coming. They're like, "Where'd you get that bass?" And we turn around, and we're like, "Oh shit!" And it's Lemmy standing there, you know, a plastic cup full of Jack, probably white boots. Uh-huh. And he looks at Kevin, and Kevin's like, like, took a minute, he's mortified. He's like, "Oh my god!" And he's like, "Where'd you get that bass?" And Lemmy's like, uh-oh. "Kevin's like." Uh, Bronin's music store in <laughs> the Bronx or something. They go, by the way, it sounds, mate. And we're like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> what the fuck just happened? <laughs> um, and then later that night, there used to be a downstairs room in Seven Willow Street, yeah, uh, which is up in Portchester. That night, no one could be in the room but Motorhead. I think Mike and Caesar want him going down there. Oh, one point. no. Oh, um, no. And, and there was rows of Jack and vodka on. There was this little kind of this fireplace kind of yeah. thing. And then uh, they went down there and they got thrown out. They're like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Let me, like, only more heads out of here. It was, just, it was hysterical. That's but it was, it was a great experience. Yeah, a lot yeah, of shots yeah. been through my life. Yeah. yeah. yeah you yeah. can hear it down the block. Like, yeah, yeah. With earplugs in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And he was getting pissed because it was so much feedback. It was so loud. Yeah, sure, sure, and sure. Was, uh, yeah. That's funny. Uh, and what, what year was it that you all went on the tour with H2O? 1997. Okay, and then that, that was all the way to, to California, right? Yeah, the breakdown. Wow. Yeah, the breakdown in uh, Salina, Kansas, which I think you've probably heard this story a couple of times. I have. I, I, I would love to hear your version. Um, okay. So we're driving. We're driving each to those van across the country because they're flying and their trailer and their um, with their tour manager, Mark, yeah. at the time. Um, so we're driving across the country. Uh, we want a breaking down in Kansas um, in front of a Marriott, I think, truck stop. Yeah. Like, coincidentally, like, thankfully, we when we wanted pushing it in. On the drive there, Lenny thought it would be a bright, it would be a great idea to bring acid with him and take it the entire trip. Like just dose acid the because we're gonna drive basically straight. Yeah. So at one point, you know, there was a bunk bed in the bag. So an hour and a half before we broke down, Lenny's like, Yeah, you want to take one? I'm like, Yeah, for sure. I took one. So me and Lenny are tripping when we have to push this van and trailer into the parking lot. So we're all fucked up. Like, we got the weed with us. Like, Warren was our tour manager, Warren, yeah. 25 to Life, who won a technique for Slayer for years. Warren was our tour manager. So we push it in. We're like, all right, fuck. We got a couple rooms. We we uh, we post up. And we're like, all right, we got to get some booze. And there was a Denny's across the way. Uh-huh. Uh, we have very little weed left. Yeah. So we're, like, rationing it out. So we wound up walking a mile to the liquor store. Which was a chicken shack, uh, like barn. It looked like it didn't even look like a fucking liquor store. Uh, like chicken wire, like whatever. We walk in, uh, we get followed around by a customer and the owner. Of course, because it was me, Warren, and I think Frank walked there. Yeah. So we looked like the United Colors of Benetton. <laughs> you know, Warren's Chinese. I'm Dominican. Frank's Dominican. But looks like a big white kid. Uh-huh. Um, and we walk in. They're like, "What the fuck?" And we're walking on the side of the road. Like no one's walking. Like we're the only ones walking. Yeah. Bring back the booze. And then we're all kind of sitting in the room watching TV, and we wound up watching that HBO song, uh, show Autopsy. Oh, okay, okay. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's up with Lenny, but Lenny passes out. Like he's, you know, he likes to sit like kind of like, you know, legs crossed. And he passes out, and his head falls into the car. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> and we're like, and and we're like oh, <laughs> shit. Uh, and we like pick him up, and he winds up passing out again. <laughs> and we're like, fuck, we get him back up. He's fine after that. So we, want, we, we stay there. We were there for three days, like two or three days, broken down, trying to figure out how to get the van fixed, uh, get another vehicle for the trailer. It was, it was marred with, like, bad everything. It was like, so then finally, <laughs> towards the end of the, 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 the time, we run out of weed. Yeah. Oh, no. Um... <laughs> And we're like, fuck, we're by that point, we're like all just smoking blunts all day to the yeah. face. Yeah. Me and Warren go to Denny's, and our server is like this teenage kid, whatever, like, how do you know, get some weed? At that time, time, that wasn't like shit you did. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. He's like, yeah, man, the fucking dish one has got an eighth in the back. We're like, we'll take it. <laughs> Came back like heroes into the room, like, yo, we got some weed. Yo, roll that shit, let's go. <laughs> and we just started rolling blunts. Like five of them just ready, and it's like passing them around. Like, let's go. Um, yeah, because coincidentally, like Warren wound up leaving the tour in Salt Lake because of something that happened. Uh, and we thought we had ran out of weed. Yeah. Warren gets on a plane, and he goes into his bag, his carry on, and his bag of like an eighth of weed or half a weed, oh my a God. quarter of weed or something. Yeah, yeah, bottom yeah, of his yeah, bag. Sure, he was sure. like, holy shit, he's, got, he's like, oh my God, he's got to go to the airport. And stuff. <laughs> but he had it all the time. Wow. Yeah. Pretty funny. Um, and, and, and what was uh, uh, what was the rest of that tour like? Hell. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it, we wound up renting a U-Haul, um, driving it across the country, hitched. Uh, I wound up getting into a fight with our drummer in Salt Lake, uh, quit the band, had a total fucking panic attack, oh, and this breakdown on the phone all night. I'm like, I'm, I got money. I'm like, I'm flying the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the phone with our managers all night. Um yeah, this is when we played Provo, and then when we were in Salt Lake, and yeah, uh, quit sure. that night, and it was just like, they convinced me to finish the tour, yeah. well, I'm going to Reno the next day, I didn't talk to the drummer the rest of the, the tour, Yeah, they stayed apart from each other, and finished the tour, 
got it to some B <laughs> at the end of the tour with H2O. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and then that was fucked up. And then we drove back. The minute we set foot into New York, Frank had a problem and he wanted quitting the band. That night, he wanted to drive me to the studio. Drove across the entire country all night. Yeah. Um, got to New York. Frank quit the band. Took a cab home. Was like, fuck it. You know, we're trying to. Then we had to deal with, excuse me, Frank quitting the band, us wanting to get rid of Ray because now this thing is here. They want to keep me in the yeah. band. And they're like, what are we going to do with Ray? Me and Ray want, you know, that whole thing culminated from, you know, our experience there. It was, and then we had to drive the van back to Selena, pick up, the, drive the oh, U-Haul, dr- drop the U-Haul off, and then hitch the trailer back to the van, everybody's meeting at the van, and then drive back to the van. Oh, my God. It was just caffeine and no-dose at the time, and no-dose was popping yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I was just popping. I drove like 17 hours at Terrible. I was like, we just gotta get home. Wow. Like, this is fucking stupid. Wow. <laughs> and then get here, and Frank had a problem with us. He wanted, you know, he was frustrated at that point. That was after the he had gotten stabbed at one point. Oh damn! Um, during one of our shows, I don't know if they talked about this. No, no, no. Um, but he had like a wound. He had stabbed the back. Um, wow. And um, yeah, it, uh, it was having back problems the entire time. Yeah, so sure. he got here. He's frustrated. You know, we're all sitting up, and I think that with us and. Where our heads were at was just like it was a it was bound to fucking happen. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like, I fucking quit. But yeah, Crank got stabbed. It was one of our shows. Damn. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of crazy. So before you before y'all went on that tour, where's the furthest that you all had played? Furthest away from New York mm-hmm. before that? We had started doing like uh, trucks up north and down the east coast. We've yeah, gone yeah, to Virginia yeah. Beach, so we, like, you know, Richmond. Yeah. Uh, D.C., Philly, we had gone up to Vermont and kind of did area, like around the areas. Yeah. We did Pittsburgh and kind of moved in, but that was our first. Before that, we were more regional. Yeah, sure. You know, um, but it wasn't until H2O we started doing little dates here. So it took us, you know, Ohio and, you know, Pittsburgh and then out west. So. Yeah, yeah. And with VOD, too, we did a couple of things. I see, I see, I yeah. see, I see. Um, and did you all, um, did you all ever... Uh, while you were together, play you know outside of the mainland U.S. Whether no, no. unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's one big regret. Like we, yeah, we put a record yeah, yeah. out in Japan, we put a record out in Japan, that's right. got that's there. Record, yeah. You know, our record was initially a European label. We never yeah. got out there. I don't know. It was just, I, it, circumstances, right? Yeah, sure, sure, try, sure. I hope to someday do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure, sure. Still, Absolutely. but uh, yeah, we never did. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. it's funny because our our LP, like our uh, vinyl, is put out by. A label from the Netherlands. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, so, uh, do you want to share more about uh, um, kind of where the band was at after the tour, what all ended up happening with the band after that? And After that, we, you know, I spoke to Frank. We all spoke to Frank. I spoke to Ray. We decided that, all right, cool. Let's just, you know, water under the bridge. Let's just, all right, let's do this. So we came back, and um, I forgot what happened next, but we, we were looking for a label deal. We were getting approached by certain labels. Like we got approached by Victory, yeah. um, a couple other small labels. I think our aspirations over-exceeded our, like, where, I, where we were actually at. I see, I see. So we were thinking of ourselves as being like, you know, we want to get songs on the fucking radio. Yeah, sure. Or like, we want to kind of escape this, you know, not escape, but kind of break apart. Um, so listen to our songs, we're like, all right, we could kind of possibly, at that time, a lot of that rap, rap, rock shit was kind of popular. Yeah, so like, yeah, all right, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. kind of fit into this kind of thing too still. So we're like, all right, cool, let's just see what we can do. So we turned a lot of that stuff down. And then um, Howie, who had co-produced and also helped us and find a producer for the Thought of It EP, yeah. was working at Zamba, which is a publishing company uh, uh, that jive and, you know, it's like Britney Spears and yeah. Backstreet Boys, but he was trying to do development deals. I see. Um, through the publishing company. Yeah. So he signed us to a development deal. Okay. Uh, with the hopes of us producing a demo that would essentially become our album. Yeah, sure. And he got us back. We got him back with Mike Barilli and, and we started recording and a lot of those songs, most all those songs appear on that um, discography. But yeah, and then we started kind of moving towards like, all right, what's the next move? We're going to try and get this. We got all equipment, new equipment, trying, trying to hone in what we're trying to do. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and write new songs. We'll just and, and, and that's what the point where it became very, very tedious. I see. We started see. writing these songs, and it was just it, writing was we weren't. It, there was a lot of pressure. Yeah, right. Sure, like sure. there's bands, like a lot of pressure to produce these things. You know, we're going to with songs. We're like, eh, I'm not there yet. Do this, do that. And for us, we're just like, uh, fuck. Yeah. yeah. And I think also for me, the expectation of what people thought I could do, as opposed to what I can, it, it was skewed. Mm. You know, I know who I am now. Like, I know what my ability is. Yeah, sure. And I play to that. Like, I'm not trying to be fucking Chino from the Deftones. Yeah. I'm, or, you know, Maynard from... Like, I, I don't have that range. Yeah, sure. So I'm not even going to e attempt. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, But yeah, at that yeah. time, those were pop bands that we were listening to and we loved. And we were like, wow, and they you, got... And you all played with Deftones, even, I think. No, right? we never oh, did. Oh, no, okay, never okay, did. okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, we played with bands associated with them. I don't know. Well, even... I don't know. We, oh, we, okay, yeah. okay, okay. But, yeah, we... No, we played with Incubus, I think. Oh, with Incubus. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 I see. But, yeah, we're like, all right, cool, like, uh, let's try and figure out, you know, where we fit in. And I, it was hard for me because it was like, those were the bands we listened to, those yeah. were the bands we wanted to kind of be in the room with, you know, that kind of very, you know, rhythmically thing, but with a great, you know, so, you know, we compensate for it by having the melody and having, like, Lenny sing certain parts. Now we have Lou, that's a really uh, good singer. To sing all the melodic parts with me on the on, on the bottom, but yeah, sure. At that time, it's like trying for something that you knew wasn't achievable. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so it was tough. I see. Yeah, and were you were you still working at Roadrunner during all? Of this no, time? no, no. At that time, like I, I actually I got fired from Roadrunner. Okay. At one point, me and the GM really didn't see head to head, which is yeah. kind of funny because I wound up working later on for uh, with working for Strong, which had Kill Switch. And funny, we wound up getting a gold record for the end of Heartache, and I wound up going back to their offices to for a billboard shot with me in the gold record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Him and I, him and I talk years later, yeah, and, he, yeah, yeah. and he actually apologized at one point for treating me like a fucking dick, uh, um, which was very unlike him. Yeah, uh, but yeah, was, but no, I wasn't at that point. I was full into the band. Full into the band. Once, see, once, see, once, see. once I got fired from there, I was like, you know, something. Fuck this, because at that point, I was still, I was still. It's like, you know, the bad thing is like kind of a fun thing that I'm yeah. kind of like, you know, kind of a cool thing, but I'm focused on the business bit. Once I got fired, I was like, you know something, fuck this. Like, I'm going to be full into the band. So yeah. I, I took all this shit I knew. I was like trying to, you know, apply it to that. And I was, I started working at a, a law office that my cousin owned uh, okay, as okay. a job, which they afforded me the opportunity to, as a paralegal, which I never did that work, but I wanted to become one. Yeah. They afforded me the, the opportunity to leave when I have to go on tour and come back and have a job. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I can leave when I, when, I, right. when I want, come back, and I had a paycheck and I yeah. work. So I did that for years Yeah, while I did the band. I see, I see, I see, I yeah. see. Um, so you, ha you have this development deal, you, you, a lot of pressure to you know, produce new material and all. Um, when does all of that come to a head and the band decides to you know, part ways with each other? This is all, I guess, during... The same period, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were trying to make it work. We had our rehearsal space monthly, we rehearsed regularly, and then Frank at that time was kind of he was a little bit uh detached. Yeah. Right? Like I think that stuff was getting to him. I'm sure he will elaborate more on it on what he was feeling at that time. But um he wasn't engaged in what we were doing. He yeah. was just like kind of checked out sure. and we made a decision to um Toss Frank. Yeah, I see. Uh, which is really tough. Yeah, and, sure. You know, I mean, he had a lot to do with our sound, you know, with the vibe. But we're like, we, we, we can't move forward. Like, he's, you know, we're, we're trying to play, like, these kind of showcase shows and do all this shit. And it was just like, he was checked out. He wasn't really writing. He wasn't really into it. And we're like, fuck it. Like, yeah. all right, man. Like, all right. And he, he wound up going. We got a friend of ours to play uh, in the band, a uh, second guitar. And then... When he was in the band, I was just like, it doesn't, we played a couple of shows with him, I was like, this doesn't feel right. Yeah, sure. You know, this feels whack, it feels like shitty, like, yeah. I don't know, it's like the, it's gone. Yeah. I was starting to, I don't know, doubt my role that we could kind of do things, it was kind of, our audience was dwindling, like, we, yeah. we weren't playing in front of the people, because, you know, we didn't, we hadn't taken that step, but we were still trying to, but yeah, sure. we weren't kind of clicking on, on, on those cylinders, but, and it was just like, you know, this shit's tired, like, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to put that effort into this anymore. So then yeah. I quit. I see. I see. 
Uh, and then it was like it turned into complete shit. Like yeah, I so. didn't talk to those guys for four years after that. We were like, oh, I see. these almost <laughs> like <laughs> bad mouthing each other. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Fuck Lenny. Fuck Frank. <laughs> I mean, Lenny fucking bad mouthed me at a show, a District Nine show. It was like, fuck I'm on. Like, you know, it was like beef with like people picking sides, and it was just like a real weird shit. Wow. It wasn't until four years later that it, I ran into Lenny, and you know, were were you still in the scene in some sense after Fahrenheit? No. Or? Yeah. I was trying to find myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah sure, know? sure, sure. Uh, I was just like, you know, at this point, when I'm in my thirties, and I'm yeah. just like. Then what I'm gonna do next? I'm trying to find. You know, I was working at, at Strong and doing management for a while until yeah. that ran its course, and I stopped doing that. But yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It was. I, I focused back more back in the business. I was like, all right, let me try and get into this side of it because the label shit it's it's so insular that I Absolutely. I can't penetrate it. You know, what yeah. I mean? like, there was no way for me to penetrate it. And that's right. And you know, Vaughn kind of gave me an opportunity because I was doing all that stuff before they came in. I see. So I see, I see, they knew that I had a head for it, and I could, you know, sure, I can get it. So. Sure. Um, and I was a guy who worked closely with him when it came to that stuff with the band. I was more like the lay- liaison with the I see. business shit. Yeah, yeah. I see. Well, before before we we keep taking things forward in time, uh, just to stick with you know the time with Fahrenheit Fahrenheit four fifty one playing shows and all. Uh, I think it I think it was you. Maybe it was Frank. I, I'm pretty sure it was you though. Told me this uh, funny story about some. Nazi kids in in Pennsylvania. I, I I think that's a story worth recording. But also, if, if anything else around white power, racist bullshit in the scene, anything you want to yeah share about that? Yeah, that was the one we were playing. I think CCs and music, huh. and we were driving back up and stop at a rest stop, and there were some video games there and stuff, and you know your typical Bob's Big Boy, whatever. Yeah, else. yeah. And um, I wound up walking up. So if someone was playing a video, a video game, some kid, two kids are playing a video game. One kid has like a huge swastika on the back of his cut off denim jacket or whatever. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And I walk up to him. I was like, yo, what's up with the swastika? And he's like, well, what's up? I'm like, what's up with the swastika? He's yeah. Like, it's what I believe in. I go, what do you believe in? He goes, uh, you know, whatever, I have a right to. And he's just like stumbling. And I was like, and at that point, it's like all of us are like now surrounding him. Yeah. These two kids, and I'm like, I was like, all right, cool. He goes, if you can't explain what you believe in, I goes, take off that jacket. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, take off the fucking jacket. Yeah, yeah. I go, or you're gonna get fucked up. Yeah. I go, and he took it off, and I was like, I go, if you're gonna walk around with that, understand that it's not gonna turn out this way all the time. Like, yeah. you're gonna, you know, I mean, you gotta answer for that. You gotta be, be willing to to defend it. Yeah. I go, so think about that the next time you put that shit on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I kept it off the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we never. I don't remember ever having like any real, you know, b- besides that, like besides overt that, yeah. kind of racism. And, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, by then it was like, then by the ninety was it was pretty, you know, Nazis bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah Which, I mean, don't come to hardcore you, shows. You Nazis bad. Right 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're in a different time now. Uh, again, it's like you know uh, history, but yeah, at that time it was pretty. You know, accepting. Yeah. You know, we never really experienced a lot of that. You know, when we traveled different places, yeah, it was like you know, sketchy spots. But yeah, sure, sure. I can't remember another time when that was like we almost got robbed once. I think in Columbus. Oh, okay. In or St. Louis. Twice it was St. Louis and Columbus. Somebody both times. One of them, some crackhead walking up to the van. Yeah. Looking inside. Yo, get out of here! Get out of here! Come back. He's like pulling handles, looking inside. It was just like <laughs> nuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um. And during all this time with Fahrenheit, were you still living in the Bronx, or had you moved out of the Bronx at that point? One, well, a couple of things. When I first started Fahrenheit, when I was first in Fahrenheit, I was living back with my mom. Yeah. In uh, on, his, uh, on the Grand Concourse after college, so because I was just I had no fucking money. Yeah, sure, sure. And sure. then a few months in, when I got a job, I wanted moving into an apartment uptown on 187th and Hoffman. Oh, okay, okay. With okay. Frank and this tattoo guy named Tony on the fifth floor walk up of his apartment building with this Italian restaurant on the bottom. Uh huh. When we worked, walk, walked in there, it was a fucking, like, total crack house. Like, yeah, yeah. Roaches everywhere. Like, it, no lock on the door. Yeah. Went in there, fixed it up. We painted the cover of the album on the building. Right, I wish I had a right. picture of it. Frank might have a picture of it. I don't have a picture of it. But 
uh, Tony did that, and it wanted to be like a little headquarters. It's like the Fahrenheit party house, right? Yeah, exactly. So we I guess District Nine too would hang out. Yeah, because on Hoffman there were a yeah. couple like the old school uh, uh, bronze metal dudes and hardcore uh, dudes all live like okay. on the walk. You know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that White Castle. Yeah, it's still, yeah, it's still yeah, there. It, it, it is, yeah. And you walk down that block, so it was all, a bunch of us lived uh, along the way until you get to Hoffman, and then we were there. Um, yeah, so we all lived there, and it wasn't. I met a girl at the time, and I want to move in, up, in with her up by Pelham. So oh, Fifth Street okay, for a okay. while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then I bounced around, lived in Queens for a minute, uh, in uh, Woodside. Yeah. Uh, then one of meeting with my towards the end uh, is my ex, I want to meet my ex wife, and I moved to Brooklyn. I see. I see. I see. And I lived in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. I see. Um, Bay Ridge. Well, do you, do you have any um, any stories from the Fahrenheit 451 house that you want to share? Uh, I don't know. Or anything that's... <laughs> <laughs> I know some you probably can't, but... <laughs> um, it was just wild, man. It was like an open-door policy. Like we, didn't, yeah. like, we didn't lock the door, which I was... For me, I was just like, yeah, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, like, I don't want leaving, like, because I was like, this is wild. Like, random, you know, Frank was funny. Frank wouldn't invite anybody to the crib. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we all smoke mad weed. So it was like, you know, all these people would be popping in. Like, I'd walk in from work. There'd be randos sitting on the couch with Frank smoking weed. And I'd be like, what are you guys doing? Like, what the fuck are these people? Get out of here. Uh, yeah, so that was the biggest thing was just the randomness of people uh, in the apartment yeah. all the time. I'd yeah. be like, I don't feel good about this. Yeah, um, yeah that was mostly it. And Frank always had a scam. <laughs> Always a side hustle. I think at that point it was like trying to do like uh, satellite dishes. Oh my god! Like Dish Network, but it wasn't legit. Yeah, he said it was legit, but it was like you know, like the the the, the, the scramble box. You know, at one point he was selling hangers, like children's books. He's always trying to find something. Oh my! Reminding me of my mother that way. Like, <laughs> That's funny. Always a scam. My mom used to sell ICs down off the window, like you know, with the little basket. Throw the money in ICs, like oh you know, of all the Dominican flavors. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 like, yeah. You know, he was like that dude, like always trying to find a scam. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, nothing really. Just the randomness of people and shit. Was Was that the apartment that? Uh, Y'all used to hang out with Dread near? Was that before y'all moved into that that place? Because Lenny and Kevin both talked about, like, every Friday night for, like, a year or a year and a half, you played dominoes with a guy named Dread. Maybe like, I think it was the neighbor. Yeah, or something. maybe. maybe I remember the name. I don't remember the face. Yeah. I remember we sang out the Mermaids a lot. On oh, the 61st Kevin day. talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Our, like, little spot to smoke. Yeah. Yeah, we were we like, yo, meet at the mermaids, boom. <laughs> like, oh, me, Mike, Little Caesar, Frank. Um, yeah, no. I remember Dread. I remember the name Dread. Yeah, I think yeah, there was those yeah, guys. Yeah. I never played Dominoes with Dread. Oh, okay, okay. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, weren't, you weren't into Dominoes, really? Ah, that was their shit. That was their shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. So, uh, Fahrenheit 451 dissolves. You're doing your own thing, finding yourself for four years uh how did you get back in touch with lenny and uh decide to do dominican day parade and all that because that's that's i guess the next the yeah, yeah. Act, right yeah, yeah. yeah um no redeeming was having a, know, like a show or some debut for something i think they're a dvd or something like that yeah. uh in the basement of the canteen next oh, to cb so okay, okay. Know, you're there it used to be cb's in the cb's canteen which is like their Venue, record store kind of thing. Yeah. And downstairs, there was like kind of a lounge. And I'd heard Lenny was going to be there. Um, yeah. And I was sick of it. I was just like, you know, I shared so much with these guys. They had so much to do with my, you know, my kind of development, just me growing up. And I had such great times with them. I was like, it was a shame. For me, I was just like, it's a shame I'm not friends with them and my friends with my childhood friend. Yeah, and sure. over some stupidity, like probably a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah, sure. So I heard Lenny was going to go there, so I went. And I went up to Lenny, and I started talking to him. Yeah. And we were just like, you know, it took a while for everybody else. Um, it took a while, longer while for Frank. Yeah. Then I talked to Ray after that. I see. The I drummer. See. For, uh, yeah, we started talking, and we were just like, you know, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is stupid. Yeah. Right, well, it's just, and then we started talking again. And, you know, and um, we became friends again. Yeah. You know, it was just like, we realized that it was just dumb shit. Yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, that was a catalyst for it. 
I see, I see, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and who who all was in Dominican Day Parade? Lenny, you, uh, Gigi, Gigi from Proof of Purchase, from Proof of Purchase, and Johnny Cage of the Fake, yeah, yeah, and right. um, and Pete, who played in No Redeeming Social Value. Oh, okay, sure. Played drums. Well, he played in a bunch of Brooklyn bands. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so we played, and it was it was a joke. It was supposed to be a joke band because we were like, you know, yeah. like I missed being in a band. Yeah, sure. Um, and we had no aspirations to put anything out. We we're just like, yo, let's just write a bunch of cliche hardcore punk songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. About just cliche, stupid subjects. Yeah, and just you know, play bars. Yeah, yeah. And we would just basically play for a bar time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just give us beer and we'll play. Yeah, and. Yeah, that was it, and you know, it wound up leading into a chance to play on the Grand Theft Auto soundtrack, which is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, and it was just us, and we would kind of switch off because you know, uh, Gigi played bass, and yep. of course, Pete played drum, so we'd switch it up, and we'd just do this fun thing, just get drunk and high, yeah. and just play dumb songs. <laughs> See how drunk and high you could get. Yeah, and play dumb songs about drinking and <laughs> yeah. hang out with your friends and yeah. you know, all this dumb, you know, all stupid shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. fun, it was a fun band to be in. Yeah, yeah. It sure. just sounds like it. I mean, and you, you, you ended up recording um, as well, right? Yeah, so, yeah, we recorded a bunch of stuff that we just yeah. put up online. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's right, that's mm-hmm. right. So, uh, and how, how did the whole Grand Theft Auto connection um, come about? My ex-wife used to work there. I had become... Uh, tight with a bunch of people who worked there, who, who, who worked there, and the owner became really tight with the owner at the time. And um, I've been talking about the, 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 the game before it came out, and uh, it was based in New York City. Yeah. Like the, and I was like, yo, you guys got to have a hardcore station on there. We were talking to him, he was like, yeah, he was like, you guys got to do it. I was just like, he was like, yeah, this is a great idea. He goes, I'm going to start doing the soundtrack. Back to you, you know, my ex I was like, don't, you know, don't get your hopes up. But, yeah. You know, you probably won't want to do it. All of a sudden, he's like, yeah, sounds great. Can you put together a soundtrack? I was like, yeah. So I basically put together the soundtrack for the LCHC uh, station, named it, got Jimmy to come in and be, he was the first, my first choice to come in. He wanted to do it. He became the DJ on the station. And they were like, we got to record little uh, bits in between the spoken stuff, yeah, sure. you know, musical bits. I'm like, oh, I got, I got a band that has a lot of like kind of funny Kind of songs we could do. He was like, "All right, come in." So me, it was just me, Pete, and Lenny walked into a booth, yeah, set up, and just played like ten random of our Dominican Day Parade songs, switched some of the lyrics, yeah, sure, sure, and uh, just played it. And they want to, you know, seven of them made it onto the uh, seven or eight of them made it onto the game. Amazing, yeah. yeah Grand Theft Auto fans out there, yeah, take note <laughs> for sure. For sure. So that was that was super fun. We're like, oh my god, this is so amazing! <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, and I want to put together my hardcore soundtrack from when I was a kid, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I want to on a piece of history. So, yeah. <laughs> Just to backtrack a little bit about um, being a freak uh, in a neighborhood full of people who didn't understand you. I remember one time when we were, we were kids, it was me, Frank, a bunch of other, like, local kids, local metal like kids that we wanted meeting. I can't remember their names. They had, like, a, a band. Yeah. I forgot what they were. Oh, they called it Jetson Knoll because <laughs> they really loved Flotsam and Jetsam. So we were like, all right, what can we name the band? What, they, what can they name the band? So kind of reflect that kind of thing. Yeah. You want to name it Jetson Null, our friend Mark, who I went to junior high school with, was a great artist. So he yeah. wound up drawing all the shirts, like doing homemade shirts, uh, which is funny. I'll show you something. He drew something for me. He did an old suicidal shirt, like a oh, rare, okay. off and all suicidal shirt. That he used to make for me in high, made for me in high school, and I got thrown out of high school for it oh. because it said "fuck <laughs> off." <laughs> uh, if you want to take a break, real quick, I can, I can go. I can go grab it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I was like, I was, my friend Mark when did all the artwork for the Jets and Nils stuff, so he did a shirt for me that I got thrown out of high school for a day for. I was like, yo, can you replicate that shirt for me? Recently, it's like a couple of years ago, so he did this. <laughs> Look at that! Wow, that's a pretty badass shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so he drew that out for me. Um, so we were walking around Taft High School, which if you know anything about Taft, is it there anymore or no? Uh, well, the building is still there, but they split it into some charter school, five right? or six different schools, yeah. something like that. So it, it was right across the street from where we live, but it was like a totally different neighborhood. Yeah. You, know, you walk into somebody else's block and it was on. Like, uh-huh. like yo, you from the block? Yeah. Ah. So we wound up going, we were by Taft and we were taking photos for the band. Yeah. You know, we were like, yo, so the band photos, like as if that, what are we going to do with that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Let's go. So we had some friends with a camera. And then um, we're walking, and this kid comes up to us, yo, what's up, man? What are you guys doing? What's going on? You guys in the band? That's cool, whatever. And then all of a sudden, it was like 30 kids from that side, from Sheridan. Oh, Sheridan okay. was notorious for being just 
hot. Yeah, yeah. All the time. All of a sudden, it's like, we're like, I don't know, it was like maybe six, seven of us. All of a sudden, a bottle flies, boom, right there. Lands, we're like, fuck, what are we going to do? We have to get across the concourse. Yeah, yeah. Like, fuck. So we're like, I forgot who yelled, like, run! <laughs> boom! <laughs> Running up, I remember my guy punched in the head, like, knocked down, got back up, running across the the concourse. And I think that night, Frank, and you might want to, I might be, you want to meeting our friend Cuba, which was this lunatic Cuban dude that we knew, who was one of our friends. And they rolled around, like, the building, like, across the street from Sharon, saw them all uh, across the street. And I think Cuba, somebody pointed a shotgun oh my God. out the window. <laughs> And someone yelled gun, and then it just all scattered outside the building. <laughs> Fast forward three weeks later or something like that, there used to be, uh, there was a blimpy on 170 that we used to go there and play video games. Mm-hmm. We used to have three video games there. We always, always kids there playing games in the back of blimpies. We saw one of those kids. And me and Frank gripped him up and just fucking tossed him up against the wall. Like, what the fuck, man? What's wrong with you? Like, like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, man. You know, it's like he's younger than us. And we're like, he was part of the whole mob. And whatever, we scared him. No, nothing ever came out of that. Man. That's kind of funny. Oh, that is funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, you're in Dem- Dominican Day Parade. You you end up on the Grand Theft Auto. Uh, as, you know, soundtrack as a radio station and everything. Um, how much longer is Dominican Day Parade around after after that? Just for a little bit. For a little um, bit. Yeah, we just kind of, you know, it ran its course. Yeah, we just its doing, course. yeah we just did doing everything stuff. you wanted to do. Yeah, it was just fun yeah. for the time being. Um, I forgot how long it lasted, to be honest with you. Again, yeah. Lenny. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, time yeah, lines, but, yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of phased out. Yeah. And then, and we did a couple of reunion, like I think we did, no, with with Dominican Day Parade. Oh, with Dominican Day. Parade. I think we did okay. one when Gigi came into town. I see, because she I see. lives all over the fucking all place. All over the place. I know. Yeah, so, I know. Um, so she came in, and we wound up doing a show at that place. It was across the street from Trash Bar. Okay. In okay, okay, okay I forgot okay, the name okay, of it, but it was a venue for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, we played there. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, was there anything between as far as you know a band? Uh, Dominican Day Parade and getting back together with Fahrenheit for you? Uh, no, there was nothing. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it was, um, you know, it, 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 it turned into, you know, like I, as I said before, you know, I started talking to Lenny and turned into Ray and then, you know, Frank was kind of the last piece because him and I had a lot of, you know, things, especially knowing each other for so long and That's had right. attention. We became friends again and all of a sudden it became kind of like, yeah, man, let's, uh, we never did a last show. Yeah. So I was like, let's just do a last show. Yeah. Um, so we wound up doing it at CDs. Uh, headlining show. We had no idea what was going to happen. We were just like, this was like four years later. What was it, 2000? We have a poster over there. I thought I did. I forgot what year it is. Yeah. 2001? Okay, okay. I don't even know. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but we wound up doing a reunion show years later. Uh, I think it was 2011. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then... We like to do a lot of shows, so we booked a show. We put up, you know, we put Billy Club, which is you know Friends, and we love that band. Maximum Penalty, which we love. Uh-huh. I wound up going out to Chicago a bunch because my best, you know, my boy Dave yeah. lived out in Chicago, so uh-huh. I wound up going to, visiting him in Chicago a lot. So I got to be be cool with uh, uh, the Killer, the band The Killer from uh-huh. Chicago, oh, okay, okay. and uh, uh, Plan of Attack. I see, I see, uh, and those guys out there. So I was like, oh, we're doing this show. Let's bring these guys out. Yeah. You know, they've never been to New York. So yeah. I brought them out. And then we start and charge one of them to the show, who I was uh, okay. kind of pseudo managing at the time. I see, I see. Um, so we got them on and we did the show. And we were like, I think it was like 20 minutes before doors. Oh, no, it was doors. Yeah. And uh, we were on the back, you know, smoking back CBs, hanging out. And Rich Hall, who was a promoter at the time, we were like, yo, Rich, like, he comes to the back and was like, yo, is anybody out there? We're like, nobody. And we're like, fuck. Nobody fucking cares. So, uh, and he wound up hanging out back there with us for a little bit. Fast forward like 20 minutes later, and somebody from the club goes, yo, man, do we want to open, let people in? <laughs> and, they're, and he's like, he's like, yeah, sure. He goes, is anybody out there? He goes, yeah, there's a line around the, around the corner. And we're like, what? <laughs> Sold out. And Amazing. great show. We wanted putting it on our deep the DVD of yeah. our discography, and it was just super fun. And we were just so glad that um, people showed up. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that many people showed up. Yeah. From all over the place. Yeah. After that, we went to Manitoba's. They were closed. I think it was like four in the morning. They wanted to close the gates, and we just hung out there until six in the morning, <laughs> just partying. We're like taking it all, and we're like, holy shit, this is wow. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. What a what an amazing last show. I mean, yeah, they did end up not being your last. Show. Well, I, I I guess. Well, it's funny because my flyers says one time only, yeah. never yeah. playing again. And, yeah. you know, as hardcore bands are, you know, they, they <laughs> never die. Never the case. There's always a good reunion show to bring you back. So, that's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. And it ha- how how many times have have you all played since then, um, or at least a, you know as, estimate around? Now like maybe ten to fifteen. Yeah, 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 yeah it's pretty yeah, sporadic, yeah. but yeah. you know we get in there every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you all just released a, a two song uh, yeah. EP. Yeah, the long time coming. First, yeah, we were very content with just being a band that just played every once in a while, and then once we got Lou in the band. And the vibe changed, yeah. right? Like dynamic change. So at one point, I'm like, you know, I was talking to Lenny. I was like, you know, why don't we? We never tried. Like, why don't we try writing two new songs? Yeah. You know, let's take a different approach. You know, what I mean, not do it the way we did it. Took a little while to get everybody kind of, you know, uh, kind of acclimated to that thing, and we wound up it wound up working out well. You know, what I mean, it's like it's a different way of dealing with things, right? Yeah, sure. It's like we're all used to our way of writing. And, Whatever, but yeah, it wound up being great, and this was really a fun experience. And we were like, "Wow, we can actually!" And I'm incredibly happy with the songs. I love them. They're great songs. Yeah. And um, I think we did a service to who we are in 2024. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's been really, really great. Yeah. And so. any any uh, shows planned in the near future? Yep, uh, we got one planned in April March, right? okay. April 12th. April 12th okay, at okay. Bowery Electric. Very electric, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, you know, yeah. Drew Stone has been supporting us and stuff like that. So yeah. it's been and sports crazy Eddie, uh, Lenny's other band, and yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be fun. Free yeah. show, so absolutely, people come down. It's like, yeah, we're not. You know, funny thing is, like, I, I'm not sure what, what, how much money plays into other people's things. For us, it's like, you know, if, if we can get enough to just get there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, for the most part, right. we're staying local, so yeah, sure. So that's all that matters. Like, we just want to play fucking shows and yeah. put it out there and. Have people listen to us so yeah yeah absolutely main motivation but yeah two, two new songs really happy um well b- before we move on to a, a couple final things mm-hmm. i want to give you the opportunity if there's any of the items that you pulled that you'd like to uh oh, yeah. say more about that you haven't haven't had the chance to show yet uh, what do we have here so we've got well the discography oh, I the, and i see the dri- a driver's license Oh, right that's there. oh, that's a view is a metal, <laughs> right? I dip like a my social security number. Hopefully. Oh, that's 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 good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it doesn't come through. Yeah, 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 yeah my yeah, old yeah, ID yeah. from college, straight up. Oh, that's a college ID. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so our discography, uh-huh. which uh, I don't know, we haven't met shows. So if you come down, we'll probably give it to you for free if you buy something something from us. Well, probably we'll definitely give it to you for free. <laughs> I don't know what else we got. We got some stickers. We got some new merch coming up. Yep. We got some buttons. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. We got merch, but uh, let's see. We've got this joint, which is. Oh yeah, look at that. A little graffiti jam. My little boy, uh, jam, my, right? my boy uh, Chino. Chino B Y I designed it. Can you see that? Oh, nice. Yeah. So you hook that up. We got the old school. That was my shit. Old school road sign. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And I thought of it is out of vinyl. Look at that. So you can grab this online anywhere. Rev has them. Yeah. You know. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so this was really awesome. Like this was something that, um, like I said, that uh, the dude uh, Jerem from Netherlands. I guess he was trying to. Um, replenish his CD collection with albums. Yeah. Discovered that we didn't have, our shit wasn't on vinyl, was a fan of ours and yeah. approached us and was like, yeah, I want to put it out and relaunch his label on, you know, on our record. So that's, awesome. that's really cool. So yeah, man, we're really happy that that's out. And yeah. finally, finally we have a record on vinyl. We never did. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Um, well, so before I ask you the final question uh, that I've been asking at the, the end of these oral histories, is there anything else that you'd like to share? You know, it could be from your musical, you know, development and and life, or it could be outside your musical 
life, anything else you'd like to share that you haven't covered in the oral history so far? Uh, when it comes to music, I'm just thankful for everybody, you know, from my mother to, you know, you know, to my friends and, you know, Frank and everybody who just exposed me to all these different things, things I did for granted, I think, as a kid. Yeah. You know, um, and it manifests itself. And like now as I'm getting older, I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? It's like it all, that all the pieces put all back together. I'm just happy that I'm, you know, friends with my friends again. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like through all, we, it's so much history that there's no reason not to be if these people are important in your life. It's like, I want to hold them close. Sure. And if we can still produce things and it's like, this is my creative outlet. And I'm, I'm happy and um, thankful to those dudes in Fahrenheit for, you know, being there also. Yeah. Because, you know, it helps me express myself in a way that I thought I'd never do again, right? Like, I was just like, I'm never going to be in this thing. So they've afforded me the opportunity to kind of say the things I want to say still in this point in my life, at this point in my life. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, so the final question I have for you, um, it could be a simple no answer or it could be, you know, a longer answer just depending on, on what you think. Mm -hmm. Is there a Bronx hardcore sound? And if you think there is... What does that sound like? Um, no, there isn't. I mean, even looking back at the times when we would go play shows and you would hear some of these bands, there's like metal, there's hip hop, there's like beat down, there's everything. Yeah. I don't, I, 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 I mean, look at, I mean, look at, just take District 9, Billy Club Sandwich, Fahrenheit. Yeah. They all sound different. Very different. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Right. And we all come from the same place. We yep. all have a lot of similar experiences. Um, yet we all sound different. Sure. Um, you know, and we're all fans of each other's. Um, and we get it, even though we don't sonically sound the same. Sure. So yeah, no, there isn't really a Bronx sound. I don't think it was that cohesive enough. You know, I mean, you yeah. go to Long Island where they had a cohesive scene, right? Yeah. So we got a lot of bands that kind of gravitated towards the sound, right? Sure. Even though there was a lot of different things, you know, right? Like you have, like, you know, you have the movie life, and then you have glass straw, and then you have VOD. Yeah, yeah. Different sounds, but there was a scene that kind of brought them all together. It, I think the Bronx was so disjointed that there was never enough people doing enough things that really created a sound. Yeah. Brooklyn, too. You, know, you had a sound back in the day, you know, Biohazard, you know. You had, like, Vanity Typo, who were very, you know, very married to each other. Sure. It was never, you know, that thing. So, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, 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 one, actually, the actual final question, I guess I'm pulling the hardcore, um, <laughs> you know, final show act right now. Um, what does the Bronx mean to you? Uh, growth. Yeah. Yeah, if I can do it in one thing. Um, not a place I want to go back sure. to, for sure. Um, but growth, it kind of ma it made me who I was, you know what I mean? It gave me perspective on things that I don't think anybody really has, yeah. except for people who are in it. Um, it's not manufactured. You can't really know what it's like until you go in and to also be a person who is an other in respect to what was going on there. It, it, it makes you, you know, it makes you a stronger person. Yeah. It makes you more resilient. And I think that's, I gain resilience from, you know just the battle of trying to just be who I was yeah, uh, in an environment that wasn't really accepting of it. Sure. Um, yeah, and that's really what it is for me. You know, with all the, the, the negativity, there's a lot of positivity. Yeah. Um, and that, I look at that more so than I look at the negative shit, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. well, thank you so much for sharing everything today. You're welcome. I um, really, really appreciate it. Thank you for all you're doing, man, for sure.